So, uh, Boker Tov, not really Boker Tov. Good afternoon. So, Raim Tovim, Erev Tov in Israel. I guess, uh, like Sefer Vayikra, today is, I believe, the middle lecture in the fourth part of a seven part series. So, the middle is always the most important. We've got people on the right, like our menorah. So, we're in the middle, uh, our Shamash, if I don't know exactly. But, anyways, uh, a pleasure to welcome back uh, Rabbi Israel as we continue our series on Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Is that so? Bakasha, Rabbi Israel. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody, um, and we are currently in the in the nine days uh, leading up to Tisha B'Av, and um, one of the things that my rabbi, uh, Rav, uh, the rabbi of my shul, said this uh, weekend, uh, the, uh, Shabbat, he always gives the Devar Halacha after Shabbat, and uh, he said that, you know, it's very difficult in today's world living in Israel, you know, what do we, what exactly do we, are we going to hope for? And he said that actually what everybody's meant to focus on this week is to really try and ask ourselves, however much the Jewish world has come forward, what do we still have to improve on? What do we have to improve on? Ben Adam le Chavero, in our interpersonal relationships. What do we have to work on in our relationship with God? And thereby to try and turn our minds to using these nine days as a, a time of, improvement, uh, both individually and, and especially collectively. So I hope that today's uh, lecture will, today's shiur, will be able to, uh, we will come out a little a little better and hope for help focus our minds in the correct way for this time of year. And today we are going to uh, learn together two different books. The first one is called Morality. Morality is um, Rabbi Sachs's final book. It's the last book he published, and he launched it in the United States and in the Canada. He no launched it in uh, September 2020, um, so you know less than a year ago, and uh, came out in England, I think, already in January 2020. Um, another book that we're going to be discussing is a book from 1997 called The Politics of Hope. The Politics of Hope. And um, I think I already mentioned that, in fact, both of these books have the same basic thesis, which we're going to hear about in a couple of minutes from Rabbi Sachs himself. But let me try and introduce both of these uh, books. Both books are about Western society. They're about the state of our society. In the case of morality, Rabbi Sachs wrote this book uh, and calls about it as uh, being the equivalent of what he calls moral climate change. He says, when we have climate change, we know something has really changed, but we don't quite understand what the causes are and we understand that things are getting volatile. Things, the, the environment around us is undergoing significant changes, but what exactly is happening? What are the causes and how can we turn the clock back on it? To a certain degree, the politics of hope, Rabbi Sachs was talking about the same sort of things. In fact, in uh, his opening, this is, as I said, from 1997 and his first, um, his first chapter is called The Blood Din Tide, right? What a ominous um, opening. And there he begins with a very, very troubling um, event, which was a case where in a shopping mall in England, and they caught this on closed circuit television, two 10 year olds took a two-year-old whose name was Jamie Bulger. Jamie Bulger was a two-year-old and two little 10-year-olds uh, simply saw him wandering away from his mother, took him by the hand, led him out of the shopping uh, center and uh, took him and killed him. Two 10-year-olds. And this shook up Great Britain in 1996. And everybody started asking and said, what, what is going on? What is going on in our society? Rabbi Sachs begins with a second story and talks about 13 March, 1996, 
Thomas Hamilton walked into the classroom of a primary school in Scotland and shot 16 young children dead together with their teacher. And in 1997, Rabbi Sachs is saying something is changing in our moral environment. In 2020, he's got other things to think about. In 2020, things have got incredibly volatile, especially thinking about the American environment. By that time, Rabbi Sachs is not just thinking about the UK, he's thinking about the global situation. And um, he has, we've witnessed a, a volatility in politics, which has, uh, you know, be it under the Brexit vote in the UK, or be it under the election of Donald Trump, where people are vilif uh, an atmosphere of vilification, an atmosphere where everybody isn't just in a situation where there is competition, but there is a sense of cancel culture. Whoever I believe in is the truth. Whoever I don't believe in is the devil. And, uh, you know, as was, was witnessed in the election of 2016 in the United States, people found they couldn't disagree it wasn't, they couldn't even disagree. They couldn't talk to their opponents. And Rabbi Sachs says, something is happening to our societies. And I have to say in both cases, what he does is he outlines the phenomenon in society. Soon we're going to get to that. He explains why this has happened philosophically, what has happened to society. And he comes up with the same solutions. By the way, the same the solution in each case, I'm, I'm gonna let the cat out, out the bag already at the beginning. The solution is a return to the we, a return to community, a return to family, a return to religion. And Rabbi Sachs is going to articulate how he feels that um, if you want, I'll put it this way. There is the state, the state is the largest thing. There is the I, there is the me. And he basically says that in between the country, the state, society as a whole, and then there's the individual, there are social units, things like family, things, things like community, things like associations, things like religious groups. And it's actually in that middle tier, in that middle strata that we can find the solution. In order to understand a bit of Rabbi Sachs's uh, philosophy here, and obviously he can, I will share my, my, my source sheet, and you can see there's at least five pages on the source sheet. But in order to, to understand where Rabbi Sachs is coming from, let's listen to him. And uh, here we're going back to, I think, an interv interview or a, a, which we've shared before, and it's from something called The Tortoise. I very much like this particular uh, interview. Uh, the, the Tortoise is an organization which they say believes in uh, thinking slowly. Um, hold on a second, sorry. And um, like a tortoise, thinking slowly. And we will um, take a look at this video. We're going to listen to a little bit of it. It's going to start off with a discussion about who do you think should be a moral leader today? Do we have faith in our moral leaders? But then Rabbi Sachs is going to articulate the basic thesis of his book, Morality. And so I'm gonna share my screen and, one minute, share computer sound. And we'll start right now. Aware of that. Um, before I turn to, to you, Rabbi, I actually was going to just reflect on the conversation we were having just before we came in here, because the, the, the question I was asking Lord Sachs was, well, who today are the moral leaders? Who are the people from whom we get, if you like, our our day-to-day -day morality? I just wanted to start by asking the room, if you were thinking, is it is it my friends? Is it my teachers? Is it my politicians? Is it somehow the figures in public like this? No, no sniggering, please. Just going to put them in as well. Is it, is it public figures? Who, who are the people who you think are the, are, if you like, the sort of holders of the flame of modern morality, or certainly your morality today? 
if I was to ask you, for example, is it, do you think, your friends? Who would say your friends are probably your best guide to sort of moral judgments that you make? Just imagine your friends. Who here thinks it is uh, teachers? Thinks that teachers are the people probably you look for? <laughs> one extremely well-taught, one and a half well-taught people <laughs> over here. Who, th who thinks that it is actually public figures? I'm not saying necessarily politicians, but, but public figures, figures with a public boring. We were talking about whether it's David Attenborough or J.K. Rowling or the Prince of Wales. Who thinks public figures are the sort of moral holders of the flame? Who here thinks, just out of interest, it's politicians? Generously to ask. Who here thinks that it were, is religious leaders? Who thinks it, just, it still is religious leaders? <laughs> I'm really struggling here because we're about at least two thirds of the way through my list. I'm, sorry, parents and family. Parents and family. All right. Well, why don't I go to you <laughs> on this, Lord Sachs? Given that we've got this, I suppose, is at the heart of the book. This sense that we're very unclear where our morality comes from. And if, and if you can, actually, I'd love you just to set out the sort of the, the core argument that we, we've outsourced morality to the markets and the state. <clears throat> James, thank you. I, I, I think the, the show of hands is very interesting because until we mentioned parents and family, we were really searching. And I remember, for instance, maybe 20 years ago, going around and asking everyone I knew for a period of some weeks, who is a sage? And almost everyone I asked replied Isaiah Berlin. <laughs> And then I said, OK, who's number two? And nobody could give me a number two. So um, it was clear that we had a problem with sagacity. And I suspect that's why you created tortoise, because we're all running so fast. We're not stopping to see the view, or as Matthew Arnold said, to see it steadily and see it whole. So we are short of sages, and that's what makes someone like James and, and Matt Ancona to found something like this. I think we're short of moral role models, with the exception of parents, where in, in, that case, in my case, exactly the same. My late parents were my moral role models, very much so. Why are we short of this? My argument in the book is because we thought we could outsource morality. We thought we could outsource lots of stuff. We thought we could outsource production to China, to Southeast Asia, and we could. Trouble is, we didn't think what impact it would have on people here. We thought we could outsource memory to Wikipedia. I mean, why need to remember anything when you can look it up in a microsecond on your phone? The only trouble is there's a difference between history and memory. History is an answer to what happened. Memory is an answer to who am I? And those are very different things. And you can't delegate identity to a computer. You can delegate facts, but not identity. So, likewise, people felt you could outsource morality to two institutions, the market and the state. Because morality is a matter of two things, the choices we make and the consequences of those choices. The choices we make are represented by the market, and that fits our, fitted a certain view of morality, which is whatever, you, whatever works for you, so long as it's legal and you can afford it. So the market became our metaphor for moral choices. And our responsibility for the consequences of bad choices, we delegated away, we outsourced to the state. What happens when marriages fail? What happens when education fails? And so on, we delegated to the state. And we said, you could run a free society on the basis of economics and politics <coughs> alone. The trouble is you can't. You can't for one simple reason. Politics and economics are arenas of competition. One is a competition for wealth. The other is a competition for power. You need something else in a society other than competition. Uh, the, the classic moment. Did you see the imitation game about Alan Turing? With, yes. You remember Benedict Cumberbatch looking lugubrious, and Kiera Knightley says, tell them a joke. And he tells them a joke. You remember, two explorers in the jungle, they hear a lion roaring. One of them starts looking for a place where the two of them can hide and escape. The other one puts his running shoes on. The first one says to the second one, what are you doing? Running shoes, you can't run faster than the lion. And the second one says, I don't need to run faster than the lion. I just need to run faster than you. Now, this summarizes Charles Darwin's dilemma. Darwin understood that every society that he knew of valued altruism. 
But if you look at the joke story, it is the altruist who gets killed by the lion. And it's the person who puts his own survival first who survives. So Darwin actually said that anyone who took risks for the sake of others would die disproportionately young, and therefore over time, the gene for altruism, I mean, he didn't use this language, the gene for altruism should go extinct. So why didn't it? And this puzzled him, and he didn't find an answer during the whole of The Origin of Species. Later, he found the answer. I wrote it in The Descent of Man. He said, any group whose members are willing to take risks and be altruistic for the sake of the group will be stronger than any group, all of whose members are only interested in their self-interest. And that has been shown to be true since the late 1970s in a whole series of disciplines, evolutionary psychology, sociobiology, evolutionary neuroscience, and game theory. So it all comes down to this conclusion, that for any group to survive, you need competition and cooperation. You need both. And you need the institutions that teach you to practice cooperation. And those institutions are families, communities, congregations, voluntary associations, charities, and they are places where we care for all of us together. So the difference between that and morality, the state and market and morality is the difference between competition and cooperation, between self-interest and the common good, between I and we. And the argument of the book is we have got to bring back morality and the institutions that sustain it because we have got to bring back the weak into this age of excessive individualism. And, and Robert, the okay, I hope people could hear that adequately. And um, I think that's quite an argument. Okay. Now he said a lot of things there, and I love how Rabbi Sachs throws out evolutionary biology, game theory, and all of that. And that's why I need to bring a video of him because he can throw those things out more than I can. Okay. But uh, let's read a little bit. That was quite a lot to swallow. So let's try and understand a bit about this um, by, I'm going to share again my screen, and we're going to read. Um, from morality, and uh, by the way, if anybody wants the link to that, it's on the sheet. So let's take a look at what he says. Um, all countries and cultures have three basic institutions. There's the economy, which is about creation and distribution of wealth. There is the state, which is about the legitimization and distribution of power. And there is the moral system, which is the voice of society within the self, the we within the eye, the common good that limits and directs our pursuit of private gain. It's the voice that says no to the individual me for the sake of the collective us. Isn't that nice? Some call it conscience. Freud called it the superego. Others speak of custom and tradition. Yet others call it natural law. Many people in the West spoke of it as the will and word of God. Whatever its source, morality is what allows us to get on with one another without endless recourse to economics or politics. There are times when we seek to get other people to do something we want or need them to do. We can pay them to do it, that's economics. We can force them to do it, that's politics. Or we can persuade them to do it because they and we are part of the same framework of virtues and values, rules and responsibility, codes and custom, conventions and constraints. That is morality. Morality is what broadens our perspective beyond the self and its desires. It places us in the midst of a collective social order. Morality has always been about the first person plural, about we. Society, said Lord Devlin, means a community of ideas. Without shared, I sorry, without shared ideas on politics, morals and ethics, no society can exist. Society is constituted by a shared morality. Now let's take this one stage further. Morality achieves something almost miraculous and fundamental to human achievement and liberty. It creates trust. It means to the extent that we belong to the same moral community, we can work together without constantly being on guard against violence, betrayal, exploitation, or deception. So I just want to try and um, explain what Rabbi Sachs has said. Rabbi Sachs has said that sometimes we need to, um, there are different ways of cooperation. You can have interest in people because they'll get gain economically. It could be that the state will force you to do something, but we also have things that we share. And sometimes I'll do something for other people because it's the right thing to do. 
And I'll decide to do that because I have a certain morality, I have a certain idea that I'm willing to forgo my own self benefit for others. And what underpins that, he says, or what goes along with that is a sense of trust. Now, what Rabbi Sachs wants to say is that that, unfortunately, in society has been eroded. And how does that been eroded? So I'm going back to the sheet. And he says like this, you know, sorry, one minute. Um, ah, here, this is what I need. Um, I'm, I'm highlighting where I am. Starting in the 1960s, that changed. The truth is, he explains it even starts before the 1960s, but, but let's go with this. First came the liberal revolution. What is that? It is not the task of law to enforce a shared morality. Morality gave way to autonomy, with the sole proviso that we do not do harm to others. Okay, and that's the ethic of today. Then in 1980s came the economic revolution. States should minimally interfere with markets. And then in the 1990s and gathering pace ever since came the technological revolution, the internet, tablets, smartphones, and their impact on the global economy and the way we communicate with one another. And then social media in particular has changed the nature of interpersonal encounter. Each of these developments has tend to place not society, but the self at the heart of moral life. It is not that we became immoral or amoral. That's not so. We care about others. We volunteer. We give to charity. We have compassion. We have a moral sense. And as he mentions in the book, today's younger generation have a very acute moral sense. But our moral vocabulary switched to a whole new sense, new concepts and ideas. Autonomy, authenticity, individualism, self-actualization, self-expression, self-esteem. But now our children and grandchildren are paying the price of abandoning a shared moral code, divided societies, dysfunctional politics, high rate of drug abuse and suicide, increasingly unequal economies, a loss of respect for truth and the protocols of reasoning together and the many other incivilities of contemporary life. I'm gonna go into, and let's just go one more paragraph. When morality is outsourced, this is what we just heard. When morality is outsourced to either the market or the state, Society has no substance, only systems, and systems are not enough. The market and the state are about wealth. That's the market and the state power. And they're hugely beneficial to the wealthy and powerful, but not always to the poor and powerless. The rich and strong will use their power to exploit the rest financially, politically, and as we know from the rise of the Me Too movement, sexually also. Thyudices tells us that when the Athenians told the Melians the strong do what they want while the weak suffer what they must. The same, it often seems, is true today. When there is no shared morality, there is no society. And this is where Rabbi Sachs, again, these are books which are not, if you want, Jewish books. If you would have asked Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Sachs would have said these are as Jewish as any of other my books. But ostensibly, he's trying to emphasize here not the situation of Judaism particularly, or even of religion. He wants to talk about something deeper. And so what does Rabbi Sachs articulate as some of the problems? And then we'll try and look at some of the solutions. Um, the first problem, problem number one, and it's gonna be a long list, okay? But I'll go through a few of them. Loneliness. He's going to talk about the fact that in Britain, They've appointed a minister for loneliness. And today, loneliness, depression, anxiety, a reliance on medication has become an acute problem. The rate of suicides has rised at an alarming pace. And it's not just about, uh, you know, amongst the young. What's going on? Why are people so lonely? And much of this he attributes, and many people have attributed also to, um, people's people engaging in just their own devices right i don't know if you visited the first station in yerushalayim but behind the first station there's a lovely piece of art artwork which says lo tov hayot adam levado it is not good for man to be alone and there's a picture of three girls on a bench each of them looking at their phones right texting each other on their phones instead of talking to one another Right now, if you know anything about 
and have read about the social effects of social media, right? One of the problems is not only that we are disconnected from others, right? We're not only disconnected, but we also, because of social media, right? Any person who has Instagram, Instagram gives you or, or filters so that you can look thinner. You can look, your skin can look better. I have to look a wreck at the moment because of the three weeks, but you know, I'm not worried too much about my social media, right? The way I look, I'm not 14. But if you're a 14 year old boy or girl, the most important thing is the way you look. And what happens if you are shamed on social media, cyber bullying, right? And I know this from my children. I've asked them what goes on on their WhatsApp group, what's going on on their Instagram. And suddenly you become intimidated and you can reach points where you are shamed by hundreds of people, something that couldn't happen before. Or as somebody said, it used to be that if you were bullied in school, you came home and you got a hug from your mom or, or your family. But with social media, bullying can follow you. It can follow you, you can't get away from it 24 seven. So loneliness, the irony is the more we're connected, somehow we feel sometimes at times lonely and social media has exacerbated that. Rabbi Sachs has uh, talks about, maybe I'll just mention a couple of other things, uh, the notion of post-truth, that we can't, that we, we've challenged the notion of truth. Everybody feels they need, in a lot of campuses, safe spaces. It's not safe to challenge people, right? The notion of victimhood, public shaming. He tells the story of Jordan Peterson, where Jordan Peterson was, a picture was taken, a selfie was taken with Jordan Peterson, with a person who had a sort of, uh, I don't know, I think it was a racial, a racially um, insulting t-shirt. Jordan Peterson wasn't wearing the t-shirt, but somebody who took a selfie with him was. And that selfie went viral, and suddenly we had cancel culture. So we've become into a much more aggressive culture where Rabbi Sachs talks about unsocial media, the breakdown of the family, um, public shaming, and all of these things, identity politics, the, um, the fact that um, politics has become so much more aggressive and so much more competitive and less genteel. And this sense that we feel our society falling apart a little bit. And, and that is where uh, Rabbi Sachs says, how exactly, what, what, what are we going to do with all of this? We, we feel this climate change taking place in our moral environment, in our social environment, but how are we going to deal with this? Let me just deal with a couple of lovely passages where Rabbi Sachs um, relates to the notion of this. Uh, <laughs> He talks about, Rabbi Sachs says that one of the things in society that we've started dealing with is self-help books, right? And in fact, Rabbi Sachs um, talks about the idea of the limits I put here, self-help, what you see on your screen, but the chapter is also actually speaks about the limits of self-help. And in fact, Rabbi Sachs starts off with a, the with a most dreadful story um, that he was on his honeymoon. He was on his honeymoon somewhere in Italy and he uh, went into a lake where it seemed like people, he, he, can't swim, he couldn't swim apparently. And he went into this lake where people seemed to be waist high and suddenly, obviously he went into a bit of the lake where the floor fell away and he was flailing away there in the water and somebody came, he went under once and twice and three times. And eventually somebody came and dragged him out of the water. He says, I'll never know who saved my life. But sometimes he says, you need to realize that, um, he says, you need to realize that you can only be saved by other people. Now, says Rabbi Sachs, he says, I admit I'm a longtime devotee of self-help books. I have felt the fear and done it anyway. I've refrained from sweating the small stuff. I've experienced the light changing magic of tidying. I know the power of now. I'm OK and you're OK. And I no longer sit worrying about who moved my cheese. He says, however, there is a problem with self-help. And he says, you can't just help yourself. Here, look at this story that we have on our sheet from Brachot, um, Duff Hay, page 5a. Please read together with me. Rabbi Chia Bar Arba fell ill, and Rabbi Orpa went to visit him, and he said to him, are your sufferings welcome to you? 
Um, Rabbi Chia Baraba replied and says, neither they nor their reward. He said to him, give me your hand. He gave him his hand and he raised him. That's Rabbi Yochanan visiting Rabbi Chia. Rabbi Yochanan then fell in and a different rabbi, Rabbi Hanina, went to visit him and he says, are you happy with your sufferings? Are your sufferings welcome to you? And he said, neither them nor their reward. He said, give me your hand. He gave him his hand and he raised him. In each case, it seems like somebody needs a hand to get out of bed. And the Gemara asks the question, why could Rabbi Yochanan not raise himself? If Rabbi Yochanan had the ability to raise Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, then why could Rabbi Yochanan not raise himself? Why did he need Rabbi Hanina to raise him? And they answer, the prisoner cannot free himself from jail. Rabbi Sachs says, help I found time and time again comes not from the self, but it comes from others. That we need other people to help us in order to help ourselves. And I'd say more than that, we can say it the other way too. He quotes Viktor Frankl, that uh, in the Nazi camps, the only sense that gave people hope was the sense that they had somebody to help, somebody else to help. That we need to have situations, right, in which we can help other people and that other people can help, help us. And that is... If he wants not self-help, but we need to be unselfing ourselves, strengthening relationship with others, responding to their needs, listening to them, having other people listen to us. The same thing is true about the uh, idea of safe space. We have a situation where in campuses around the world, students seem to have become more um, fragile. Ironically, right, uh, a generation who have more than their parents have become fragile. Sometimes they call them the snowflake generation, and they seem to uh, are asking, you know, not to have, they need trigger warnings. And uh, again, we can argue whether these are good things. Do you need trigger warnings? This has led to a cancel culture that I say those ideas are you know, they, they threaten me, they make me insecure. And Rabbi Sachs, when he talks about this, talks about the culture of debate and that Judaism models a culture of debate and that we grow more when we encounter people who are not like us. And here, once again, in a minute, we'll talk about identity politics, but um, let's just read this lovely Gemara, which Rabbi Sachs brings. And I'm trying to show you how in this book, Rabbi Sachs will present a problem. And then he will bring stories which express from society at large. But he almost in every chapter brings a Gemara or brings a Midrash, which expresses a Jewish view on how to resolve this problem. And let's take a look um, at the story of one of the greatest Chavrutot, one of the greatest learning pairs of all time, Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan. Just to introduce them, we're talking about two scholars who are in the um, fourth century in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, they are the greatest Amoraim of Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Yochanan is responsible for the, the backbone of the Yerushalmi. Rabbi Yochanan lived in Tiberia. I don't know if you know that Yerushalmi wasn't written in Yerushalayim, it was written in Eretz Yisrael. And the main Amor was Rabbi Yochanan himself. And Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish were chavrutot for 40 years. And then, and Rabbi Yoch and, and Reish Lakish died. And so let's read together. Nachna sheit Rabbi ben Lakish v'havai kamit stay Rabbi Yochanan batrei. Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Reish Lakish died and Rabbi Yochanan was sorely pained over losing him. The rabbi said, who will go to calm Rabbi Yochanan's mind and comfort him over his loss? They said, let Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat go, as his statements are so sharp. In other words, who can be Rabbi Yochanan's chavrusa? We need the sharpest person possible. Ah, Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat. Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat went and sat before Rabbi Yochanan with regard to every matter that Rabbi Yochanan would say. Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat said to him, there's a ruling which is taught in a brighter that supports your opinion. In other words, Rabbi Lazar ben Padat was so knowledgeable that he could give Rabbi Yochanan a source for anything he said. Rabbi Yochanan said to him, are you comparable to Reish Lakish? 
when I discuss things with Reish Lakish, when I would state one thing, he would raise 24 difficulties against me to disprove my claim. And I would answer him with 24 answers. And the halakha would become broadened and clarified. And yet you say to me, there's a ruling which is taught in a brighter that supports your opinion. Do I not know that what I said is good? <laughs> in other words, R- Rabbi Yochanan said, I need a chabruta who argues with me. I need a chabruta who brings a different view. I don't need a chabruta who reinforces me. Rabbi Yochanan went around rending his clothing, weeping and saying, where are you, son of Lakish? Where are you, son of Lakish? Rabbi Yochanan screamed until his mind was taken from him. He went insane. And the rabbis praised and requested for God to have mercy on him and take his soul. And Rabbi Yochanan died. Says uh, Rabbi, says, uh, Rabbi Sachs, and he brings this an example, many, many other examples of Rabbi Hillel and Shammai and what have you, that we don't need uh, echo chambers, we don't need safe spaces, we actually need to learn the art of elegance uh, debate. And we need to hear ideas. Rabbi Sachs in his famous TED talk talks about the idea that his wife is completely different to him. And particularly because his wife is so different to him, that is why he is attracted to her and that is why she helps make him whole. He says, we need to find people who enlarge us, not people who reinforce us. And that's another effect of social media, that sometimes we uh, are in environments in which uh, social media, you know, I don't know if you've read, uh, seen that movie about uh, social media, but it talks about the out, what do we like more than anything else? We like being told we're right. So social media is set in order to reinforce us. We wait for the likes and we want all of that. But when they reinforce us, then the more we hear, then when we hear things which attack us, we don't want to hear them anymore. So this is a big problem of safe spaces where we've moved from the we to the I, and now we can't even cope with alternative views. The last thing I wanna talk about in terms of the problems that Rabbi Sachs brings is the problem of Um, hold on, sorry, I'm just adjusting my computer, is the problem of uh, identity politics. And we've all heard of identity politics. And I want to share with you a bit of a video, a very short interview with Rabbi Sachs from um, the period of Corona where he was stuck in his attic um, (laughs) doing interviews on Zoom like we are now. And He was actually engaging with a Christian group called Nexus. It's a lovely, lovely interview. I've given, again, given you the the link, so you'll see it on your sheet. But um, I want to share with you this, a bit of an interview where he talks talks about um, identity politics. So again, hold on one second, just one minute. Um, Just make sure I'm sharing the sound. Yes, I am. Okay, so uh, listen to this. We'll listen for a couple of minutes. My name is Matthew Garces, originally from Georgia, but currently live in Washington, D.C. A question I have for you is, as an individual, I possess many identities. I'm a Christian, a Latino, a man, just to name a few. Is there a right way to involve identity in politics without descending into the dangers of identity politics? We all have identities. Hopefully not too many of us have identity politics because identity politics is a way of saying my particular identity is all that matters. And of course, Matthew rightly says for none of us is that true. We've got multiple identities. Mm -hmm. I'm Jewish, I'm English, I'm British, I'm European, I'm Western, and I have many other things as well. So um, I, I, I think we're all multiple identities and identity politics, number one, radically simplifies that to a point which is really dehumanizing because we're all bigger than one box. Secondly, it is closely identified with the concept of victimhood. I suffer because I am X. 
And victimhood is a really, really bad thing. Because, I mean, there are victims and we have to help victims and we must be compassionate and caring about them. But for me to define myself as a victim is really quite dangerous because if I define myself as a victim, I am saying that someone else other than me is responsible for my fate. In other words, I am handing over sovereignty over my life to somebody else. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to hand over my sovereignty to anyone else. Um, and therefore, um, and I learned this from, from Holocaust survivors. All those years that I was chief rabbi, I became very, very close to our British Holocaust survivors. And the extraordinary thing is they were all victims, but none of them defined themselves as victims. They said, no, we're going to take responsibility for our life. And I found that moral courage of a high order, and I could never, ever go down that road of victimhood again. Victimhood, in other words, um, is a no-through road. It's a blind alley. Once you put yourself there, there's, there's really no way out. And thirdly, you know, what then becomes of identity? And the short answer is... Um, I will invoke the identity I choose when I think it adds something to the conversation. So, for instance, I'm a rabbi, I'm a religious leader. But you will know from the book that that was, as it were, my second career. My first career was as a professional philosopher. So, um, you know, I... I I thought to myself, you know, that in, in the year 2000, there was a bit, summer of 2000, there was a big gathering of 2000 religious leaders um, at the United Nations, modestly entitled the Millennium Peace Summit. Put 2000 religious leaders together, you do not get peace. But, um, and you, you know, you're sitting there thinking, who am I? You know, they're, I'm one in 2000. And then I thought, hang on, no, no, no. Uh, not every religious leader is a philosopher. Mm. And not every philosopher is a religious leader. So that combination of identities helped me say something that was really different from almost everyone else. Um, so I think I can speak in the public domain, for instance, as a Jew. If I feel there's something very universal about the Jewish experience, that the Jewish experience gives particular expression to. And then I can drop that into the conversation and people will say to me, thank you for sharing that with us. And I think that applies to any kind of identity. Mm -hmm. There will be times when one or other of our identities allows us to contribute something to the conversation um, that nobody else can. And that is how you do identity without identity politics. That's good. That's very good advice. Uh, our next uh, question comes from Elise Bay, who is... Okay, so I hope people could hear that okay. And um, let's, um, let's move on to some of the solutions. <laughs> if he spoke about, by the way, already I think that video started giving us solutions. Because what he says in that video is he says, identity politics creates us as victims. Identity politics labels us. I will say, let's say I am a person of color, I was, my ancestors were enslaved by because of that. I am still a victim of all of that, and now you owe me. Now, first of all, the victimhood means, first of all, I'm only identified. I might be a person of color, but I also might be a doctor, and I might have a religious identity, and I might be an expert biker, and I might be fantastic with a camera, and I can contribute so much, but I just talk about the fact that I'm, you know, uh, one particular, and it's to do with the fact that society have done me wrong. Rabbi Sachs says exactly the opposite. Don't be a victim and use all your identities. Don't, you've got lots of identities. 
You might be a parent. You're a child. You might be religious. You might be secular. You might be a manager. And therefore, you've got something to talk about management. Why focus on one thing? And second of all, use all of those identities to contribute. So this takes us directly into some of the solutions. And I'm going to share our screen and a lovely image that Rabbi Sachs brings, which is such an English image, uh, which uh, some of you might have even visited here. But Rabbi Sachs, used to, when he was chief rabbi, lived in um, St. John's Wood. And uh, this was uh, that's the residence of the chief rabbi, a uh, chief rabbi or was. And this is what he says. Uh, it's on your screen, the politics of hope, pages 41 to 44. Not far from where we live, he says, in northwest London is Regent's Park. And most times of the day, it's full of people relaxing, talking, drinking coffee, reading the papers, jogging, walking, exercising the dog, meeting friends, or just enjoying the sight of other people enjoying themselves. The point about it is it's a public place. It's somewhere where you can all go on equal terms. It is surrounded by private homes, places where I and most of the people who love the park know we could never afford to live, have much we'd like to do so, but that regret is tempered by the fact that something far more magnificent. The park itself is ours. In it, we are equal citizens. And because we enjoy it and want it to be there, we keep to the rules. Usually without having to be told, we keep radios quiet, dogs on a leash. We put our litter in the baskets, returning a passing stranger's smile and otherwise respect people's privacy. That is part of what makes it a gracious place. For me, the park is a metaphor for a concept I've been inching towards without yet spelling it out, namely society. Society needs social virtues, much as our enjoyment of the park depends upon its users respecting it and other people who use it. When these habits break down, we need not just law, but collective resolve, many people deciding together to save something they love. So what's a park? <laughs> Rabbi Sachs says you've got individuals, you've got families, and then you've got the state, but then you've got this park where everybody can share. But everybody has to keep the rules, because if I start, you know, littering, or if I start making too much noise, or if I, you know, take my Jeep and, and you know, ride all over the grass and rip it up, then there's not going to be anything for everybody else. But we all enjoy the park because it's something we couldn't own. We couldn't have a big expanse like that. Yeah, and it's a collective value. Now, how do we learn the, the proverbial park? How do we learn the things that we share, the things that we share together, which rely on a certain civility? And one of the areas that Rabbi Sachs is going to talk about learning this is the family. Again, please excuse me for reading so much, but he just says it so well. Considering, consider a family, father, mother, and children, they live and eat and relax together, though each wants times and spaces where they can be alone. There are certain rules which bind them together, without which they would find it difficult to get along. Let us suppose they include such things as that at least some nights of the week they eat together. Not everyone talks at once. There is a roughly equitable sharing of responsibilities for cutting the grass, doing the dishes, feeding the cat, and making the beds. And then when mum and dad say so, it's time to go to bed, there are rituals of protest followed by reluctant obedience. Sometimes the rules break down as they do in every family. There are arguments, scenes, minor rebellions. These are followed by routines of reconciliation. Someone says sorry, he or she is forgiven, order is restored, love is reaffirmed. In this sequence of everyday transactions, we witness in miniature the making and sustaining of the moral life. The family is made up of individuals, but it exists because each is willing to place limits on the pursuit of his or her own desires. Deep beneath the surface of the family are certain fundamental concepts, fidelity, loyalty, responsibility, authority, obedience, justice, and compassion. Together, they define the relationships of the parents and children to one another. They frame a series of expectations that neither husband or wife will commit adultery. And when children are young, they'll do what their parents are told. Sometimes, though as rarely as possible, without fully understanding why. The parents' requests will be consistent. 
fair in the long-term interest of children, and that members of the family will not walk out on each other or ignore a cry for help, except in extreme situations. These things do not need to be spelled out because the family is a social institution. It is not something its members have invented any more than they've made the language they speak. It's something they have inherited from culture, from habit or custom, or the example of their parents or possibly religious teaching. For one of the ba when one of the basic rules is broken, there's a breach in the wall of trust. And unless it's mended, the family will not be the same again. The family is often thought of as being belonging to the sphere of private life, but it's easy to see how it is the birthplace of social virtues. It teaches us that the space we seek to create for ourselves is dependent on being able to rely on other people with whom we have established relationships of predictability and mutuality. Um, and he goes on and talks about the idea of trust and the trust that we learn within families. Now, by the way, in his book, Morality, Rabbi Sachs also has a whole chapter at the end on religion. And he says, um, talks about the idea of religion as well, as religion is being a place where, again, we learn the notion of morality, we learn altruism, we learn community, we learn authority, we learn values, marriages, right? And all sorts of different things. So it's not only um, family where this happens. And of course, by the way, the breakdown of the family, Rabbi Sachs sees is both a product and an accelerator for all of the processes. Once we decide that we want to follow our own individual choices, once we can follow our own, let's even start, Rabbi Sachs goes back to Immanuel Kant. And he says, once you decide that the ultimate moral voice is me, but if society is telling me not to practice, you know, to practice differently from my moral voice, then I say, well, I'm gonna go my own way. In family, I'm going to decide, you know, not to live in a family structure, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's just go one stage further if you will. Um, okay, um, I want to go to one further really important point, which we're going to deal with, please God, in a future class as well. And let's uh, talk a little bit about the notion of covenant. The notion of covenant is one of the most central, I'd say both family and the notion of covenant is one of the most central ideas of Rabbi Sachs's thought. It's very deeply embedded into the idea of the, the, the book that we discussed last week, The Letter in the Scroll, and it's at the core of the politics of hope and of the book morality. Why? Because Rabbi Sachs is going to explain that the notion of covenant is when we all agree to do something together. And again, just let's let's uh, read this a little bit, and 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 then we'll I'll try and summarize. One of the key differences between a society based on contract and one built around the idea of covenant is what holds it together. Let's look here. A social contract is maintained by external force, the monopoly within the state of justified use of coercive power. A covenant, by contrast, is maintained by internalized sense of identity, kinship, loyalty, obligation, responsibility, and reciprocity. These promptings cannot always be taken for granted and have to be carefully nurtured and sustained. Hence the centrality within covenantal associations of education, ritual, sacred narratives and collective ceremonies. So I want you to see that what he's saying here is that actually we need um, education. Sorry, here we go. Yes, education ritual, sacred narratives, and collective ceremony. In other words, every country needs those things. Every society needs those things. Even families have those. There are certain family stories or certain rituals you do together. There are certain sacred days, we, you know, as a religion, but also as a nation. Tisha B'Av would be one of them. In Israeli society, Tisha B'Av has a certain, there's just come out a, a, a new movie called Agadot Horban, where they're using Tisha B'Av as a metaphor for society and talking about how society becomes unraveled through the story of the Second Temple. Certain collective memory, 
Okay, let's let's just look here. A social contract gives rise to the instrumentalities of the state, governments, nations, parties, the use of centralized power and the mediated resolution of conflict. It's the basis of political society. However, a covenant gives rise to different institutions, families, communities, people, traditions, and voluntary associations. It's the basis of civil society. This is one of the ways of understanding the difference between man as a political animal and man as a social animal. So there are two stories about human associations. One is told in our political classics, the other in our great religious texts. Clearly they're not mutually exclusive. We need both. Civil society requires institution of politics for the resolution of its conflicts and the maintenance of peace and defense. Political society, according to most of the series, needs the ungirding of the civil virtue. Let me just explain. In other words, it's not enough to have a government because if there's no society, if there's no civil society, then you have to just rule by force. It needs the undergirding of civil virtue. Both stories represent the enduring truths about the human situation and both need to be told if people are to live together peaceably for any length of time. To some extent, they represent a different emphasis between the Greek, which is the politics and the Jewish tradition. The driving force of the biblical drama is not self-interest, but something else for which the Hebrew word is chesed, usually translated as compassion, but more accurately, chesed should be translated as covenantal obligation. It means the duties and responsibilities that flow from identification and belonging, the kind of relationship that exists between husbands and wives or parents and children. What constitutes society in this view is not a contract, but a covenant, a Brit. One difference between them is that those bound by a covenant are obligated to respond to one another beyond the letter of the law. Rather than to limit their obligations to the narrowest contractual agreement. Another is that covenants have a moral component that renders them more binding and open ending than could be accounted for in terms of interest. As Daniel, as I puts it, covenant expresses the idea that people can freely create communities and polities, pub peoples and publics and civil society through such morally ground, grounded and sustained compacts, establish enduring partnerships. To put it simply, parties can disengage from contract when it's no longer their mutual benefit to continue. A covenant binds them, perhaps especially in difficult times. This is because covenant is predicated on interest but instead on, it is not predicated on interest, but instead on loyalty, fidelity, holding together even when things are driving you apart. This helps us understand this thing of another key word of Judaism, emuna, often wrongly translated as faith. Faith is a cognitive or intellectual attribute. Emuna is a moral one. It means faithfulness. What is Rabbi Sachs getting at? He says very simply, it is not enough to have the state. It is not enough to rely on the economy. We cannot let society push us into our individual silos so that everybody sits opposite their computer screen like we're doing now, right? And just worries about themselves because that way we will find ourselves increasingly lonely. We all cry ourselves in self-help. We will find ourselves in a situation in which we are increasingly more agitated when we come into contact with other people and we will find ourselves digging into our own grief, our victimhood, our identity politi politics. Um, we will just follow our own self-interest. We will worry about our own truth and won't be able to argue with other people. And therefore what we need to rediscover is the we. We need to rediscover the way to turn back the tide is to find the we, to find the collective. Um, he loves talking about Robert Putnam, the Harvard um, philosopher and sociologist who says that people used to go out bowling in groups and now people increasingly go out bowling alone. We engage in recreation, but we engage as individuals by ourselves. Now, by the way, um, I don't know if you feel this in your own life, but sometimes I do feel that even I'm susceptible to this. And the sons of I'll say, you know, why do I need to bother? People are really annoying. You know where I felt it? I felt it going back to shul after lockdown. I said, well, you know, when I had Kabbalat Shabbat in my house, we sang whatever tune I want. Now I need to sing his tune for Lachadodi. 
right? Even more than that, I went back to shul and I said to my wife after the first time I went back, do you know there are a lot of strange people in shul? There's that guy who's always yelling at people. There's that guy who's always coughing and spluttering. There's the other guy who's always letting his kids talk loudly. And there's the fourth guy, right, who's, uh, you know, dovens very loudly. I suddenly realized how many, you know, strange people we have in our shul. And then I thought back to the shul I grew up in. And there was also, you know, there was not only the candy man, but there was the shamus who was a real character. And there was, you know, all the characters we know from shul right? The annoying people, the funny people, the talking people. And I said, wow, that's what it is not to be in your own space. That's what it is to be a community. And you know what? When they have a simcha, we go and shake their hands and we're happy for them. And when people are bereaved, we go and visit them and shiver and we call, we have a community and we're all different. But you know what? We're, we're richer for it. But we also learn how to deal with annoying people, <laughs> Wow, because not everything always goes our way. That's part of being in the park. And what happens when people don't keep the rules and people sometimes have to limit themselves, but that's what it is because we become poorer when we're just in our spaces. He, he even says something very interesting. He says that in society, we thought that we could all become individuals, um, but he says that sometimes the people who have suffered the most are actually the low, he says, divide society into thirds. He says in the breakdown of the family, in the, in the highest third of society, even if there's been divorce and what have you, they've got the means in order to be able to remain buoyant, to remain afloat. But then the lowest third of society, right? The fact that society is, that, that people haven't remained in relationships and don't have the wherewithal to keep their relationships going because they're pursuing the me instead of the we means that the amount of number of people who don't even know their parents, who uh, it's in, in very poor environments has meant the bottom third of society socioeconomically has suffered greatly from the breakdown of the family. Um, and therefore he says, we have to reinforce the we, we have to find ways and he has ways of actually trying to think about how to restore that collective narrative. And I'm, I'm actually going to talk about that, please God, in a future class. So this is the basic thesis of morality, the politics of Pope. And somebody I saw in the chat, hold on, let me just open the chat. Um, somebody related to uh, the covenant between Hashem and the Jewish people um, is, um, oh, I see. So what I want to say about uh, indeed, Rabbi Sachs will say that there is definitely a covenant of punishment, but Rabbi Sachs says more than the covenant of punishment, there's a covenant of agreement. And he says that um, one of the first things about Sefer Shemot is that it's not only that we each have an individual covenant with God, but we have a collective covenant as a people. One of the things that the Jewish people did at Mount Sinai was they made a covenant with God. God asked them, do you want to? And they had to agree. It was free will. But at that same covenant, there are 12 stones, it says 12 monuments expressing the 12 tribes. And what that means is that God is not just, it's not just a monolithic people. It's a people of 12 different tribes, which means 12 different ethnicities, 12 different needs, 12 different, um, call them accents or, or, or what we nowadays call nationalities, 12 different tribes with each of their very, very different atmosphere. And yet 12 different, different groups come together and God says to them, will you accept the Torah? And they do. Now it's true that every society needs law and therefore there is a covenant of punishment that once there is, once you buy into the covenant, it's not always a free will. And yet at the same time, Rabbi Sachs is trying to say, you can't just have the state or the markets and then have the individual. We need to reinforce that middle tier the public park, the metaphorical public park, we need to in, we need to reinforce the we, the collective, and the best way to do that is by reinforcing the family, and reinforcing religious groups. Uh, religious groups teach people how to get along with others, how to give charity, how to volunteer, how to do all of those things which thicken society and help us learn um, what he calls in his other book. The dignity of difference. So um, that's his politics of hope. That's his message about how we can reverse climate change. 
uh, so, you know, moral climate change. And uh, thank you for joining me this week. And uh, please God, next week, we'll be talking about right, Sachs's attitude towards the state of Israel. The state of Israel, how do Rabbi Sachs look at Medinat Israel? Um, and I want to talk about this, and we're going to come back to this idea of the covenant when we come back to the state of Israel. Right, in fact, Rabbi Sachs, one of his things we're going to talk about next week is he says that the state of Israel had to deal for the first 50 years of its existence with survival. But now, how are we going to develop civil society? How are we going to learn not just to be a state of survival, but a state of flourishing? And how are we going to do that? Not through the state, not through the individual, but through civil society by having a common narrative, a common covenant. So we're going to be coming back to these themes in our discussion next year about Medina, the next week about Medina Israel. So thank you. Thank you to Rabbi Kelman. Thank you to Torah in Motion. And thank you to all of you for participating. Thank you. Okay, please, God, we'll see you next week and uh, have a meaningful Tisha B'Av. And uh, Tisha B'Av, I, I think, I, I, I get things a little different in Israel than here. You sort of alluded to that earlier. But, uh, you know, it's... Uh, Anyways, but as many of you know, we uh, please sign up. We have an all-day Tisha B'Av program. We're in Israel and late afternoon, evening Tisha B'Av program. But here we start at 11 a.m. Eastern through uh, 7.15 p.m. So eight talks back to back to back to back to back to back. I may have missed the back there, but you get the idea. Uh, I'll keep you busy all day. Um, different topics, great speakers. And uh, um, so we hope you'll join us, of course, Tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Eastern, Rachel Sharansky Danziger continues her series on storytellings and the rise of kings. Um, Wednesday, Marty Lakshin is back, continuing his series on Pshat Rush and Halakha. That's at 11 a.m. And Simi Peters on Sefer Yermio at 1. And Moshe Sokolov on the tour of the week at um, 8 p.m. And Thursday, uh, we have Shuli Mishkin at 11, her touring of Israel, and Jonathan Ziering on the Shemitah. And Rachel Slatkan and Parsha, Friday, 9.30 a.m., my part, my shir on Parsha, not Parsha, on Perkei Avot. And um, yeah, and that's it. On Sunday, yes, the program is on Tisha B'Av itself. The Tisha B'Av program, and Menachem Liebtag will be speaking. He'll be, he normally gives the Sunday shir. He'll be giving at, 11, at 12 as opposed to 11. 11 a.m., uh, Shuli Mishkin will be giving the shir. Uh, 1 p.m., Chaim Strachler, Rabbi Chaim Strachler, I'm giving the shear at 2 p.m., 3 p.m. Tamara Spitz is giving the shear. Um, 4 p.m. is Rabbi Nadi Helfgott, and 5 p.m. is Moshe Sokolov, and 6 p.m. we'll have a um, filmmaker talking about films of the Holocaust. So that's the, uh, that's the program on Tisha B'Av. Um, a sign-up, I did send out, yes, it, it's the same sign-in for this. I did send out, if you didn't get it, I don't know why, I sent out on Friday. Um, uh, the um, information in an email. So if you didn't get it, I don't know why, but if you go on the website, it's um, it should be there and you can sign up. It'll be the same sign in as this class is with the summer, um, whatever, the summer password. Okay, but we have, I'll, I'll send that out again. And if you don't get it, let me know. Um, I don't know why, but th these things do happen sometimes. All right, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. And uh, we look forward to learning with you. And as I say often, and I encourage you, just invite one friend, invite one friend to come who hasn't experienced uh, one of our classes. And uh, that would be the biggest favor you could do for us and hopefully for them, or more for them than for us. And uh, we look forward to learning with you and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.